Poems and Songs in the Lancashire Dialect, Part 2, Episode 1, by Samuel Laycock. All his poems were written after the Lancashire Cotton Famine, the period of distress brought on by the American Civil War, which lasted from 1861 to 1865. Cheer Up, Toiling Brothers, by Samuel Laycock. Cheer up, toiling brothers, cheer up and be glad. There's breed today's for us in store. Things are looking more settled in Lancashire here. Now at the America war's getting o'er. The long chimneys are smoking as hard as they come, and the machinery's whirling around. Our shop mates that haven't been seen for some years are a getting back to thou ground. Billy Taylor, he's been off at Bradford a while. We've been woolen for one master hoons, but he's brought himself back to this quarter again, and he's pegging away at thowed looms. Their jack's been in Staffordshire one or two years. He and somewhere to up Bilston, I think. He gardened and did them odd jobs about thouse, and he'd twelve bob a week and his drink. And how crony of mine's been at Halifax yon, selling trotters and tripe and gallio. In winter he cockles and mussels and stuff, and he tells me he did rear and wheel. When the way to work started up to our Swanshaw brute, he was a gaffer a while or some man, but for some cause or other he's left him, I see, and get him factory again. Polly Brown's been in service for two or three years, a tail house at name at Bull's Yad, and her and a waiter there is about place, they're telling me I'm bound to be wed. Our loose is in service up Huddersfield way, with some chap I've forgotten his name, but whoever who says who shall leave in a month when they have put her some work in her frame. He, we had done some knocking about up and down, while trade's been so bad about here. We could spin some rare yarns, some on us, I know. We could tell some strange tales now fear. We ain't had to set do and do all sorts of jobs, and we've been among all sorts of folks. There's thousands in Lancashire know what it is to go round a begging with pokes. A lot of young jacks that I know very well made it up to go singing one day, but the very first place that they sung at, I was told, they gan em a crown to go away. Then they sung for a doctor a bit further up, and Boas sent one of his men, where yelling and told him he'd give em to more, if they'd sing him the Sherat song again. But come lads will say now about this no more, but try and forget all that's past. It were the first time we'd ever done out to this sort, and we're living in oaks, and it's the last. Let's be careful in future the bit we can get, and pay off what debts we may owe. We ain't had houses to live in, clothes, tommy and stuff, that's never been paid for, I know. Let's be honest to those that were friendly to us, and show be our actions we men. There's nobody can tell what's before them in world. We may happen one help it again. Now you'll kindly excuse any blunders I've made, for I've written as well as I can, and beg to remain with respect and esteem, yours truly, a poor working mon. The Stricken Stokers by Samuel Laycock. Whatever's to do with your Manchester way, with your stokers, dense fogs, and poor gas, one expects something better now this wordy fray, this setting a class against class. Now I'm no one going to argue who's wrong or who's right, to such wisdom I'm laying a claim. Still I fancy if facts were brought fairly to late, there'd be more no one party to blame. But there's one point, I think, on which all will agree. There's a lot of real suffering about, and most men keep starving, and are they to dee till we scribblers have done fine out? Come let me appeal to you, Tories or Rads, for we're all made of one sort of clay. Shall it ever be said that we Lancashire lads treated the helpless and poor in this way? Do you say they're to blame? Well, well, granted they are. Who is there that always does reap? Can we finally expect men to walk o'er a snare without ever hurting the feet? 
But that isn't the question what we've got to do, and I think we can hardly do less, is to show our old mates we've for helping them through this painful, this sad distress. With Christmas near to that brief season of mirth, when joy bells will merrily ring, reminding us all of that wondrous birth of a brother, a saviour and king, then many a rich divers will be feasting off best, drinking wine out of vessels of gold. But who's to ask Lazarus in as a guest? Is he to stop out in the cowd? Boughton's Yard by Samuel Laycock At number one in Boughton's Yard, me granny keeps a school, but hasn't money scholars yet, there's only one or two. They send thou woman's rather cross, well, well, it may be so. I know who boxed me rarely once, and pooed me ears and all. At number two lives widow Burns, who washes clothes for folk. Their belly, that's a son, gets jobs at wheeling coke. They send who courts with Sam and Ed's that lives at number three. It may be so, I can't tell, it matters not to me. At number three, reek facing pump, Ned Grimshaw keeps a shop. He's Eccles cakes and gingerbread and treagle beer and pop. He sells oat cakes and all, does Ned. He has both soft and hard, and everybody buys off him that lives in Belton's yard. At number four, Jack Blunderick lives. He goes to mill and waves. And then at weekend, when it's time, he pows a bit and shaves. He's badly off, his Jack, poor lad. He's rather lame, they send, and his children keep him down a bit. I think they are nine or ten. At number five I live myself, we old Susanna Grimes, but don't like so very well, who turns me out sometimes. And when I'm in, there's net no leak, I have to cower it dark. I canna pay me lodging brass, because I'm out of work. At number six, next door to us, and close on side at Spout, old Susie Collins sells small drink, but who's welly all is bout. But how it is, that is the case, I'm sure I canna tell. Who happen makes it very sweet, and sups it all a sell. At number seven, there's nobody lives, they left it yesterday. The bum bailiffs come and mark their things, and took em all away. They took em in a donkey cart, I know now where they went. I reckon they've been taken and sold, because they owed some rent. At number eight, they're Yorkshire folk, there's only the man and wife. I think I ne'er see nicer folk, nor these in all me life. You'll never hear em fawing out, like lots of married folk. They always seems good-tempered-like, and ready we a joke. At number nine, thou cobbler lives, thou chap at men's my shoon. He's getting very weak and done, he'll have to leave us soon. He reads his Bible every day and sings just like a lark. He says he's practising for heaven, he's well he done his work. At number ten, James Bowton lives, he's the noisest house in row. He's always plenty of summer tea and lots of brass and all. And when he rides and walks about, he's dressed up very fine, but he isn't half as near to heaven as him at number nine. At number eleven, me uncle lives. I call him Uncle Tom. He goes to concerts up and down, and plays a kettle drum, in bands of music and such things. He seems to tack a pride, and always makes as big a noise as all in place beside. At number twelve, at Thunder Row, Joe Stiggin deals in ale. He's sixpenny and fourpenny, dark coloured, and he's pale. But I never touch it, for I know it's ruined money a bard. I'm the only chap as doesn't drink that lives in Bowton's yard. I know I've done, I'll say goodbye, and leave you for a while. I know I haven't told me tale in such a first-rate style. But if you're pleased, I'm satisfied, and ask for no reward for telling who me neighbours are 
that lives in Belton's yard. Clouds and Sunshine by Samuel Laycock Well, readers, I'm glad that we met once again, and though we're a year or two older, let's hope that our love for each other and God hasn't grown any feebler or cowder. I think I'm a venture to flatter myself. I'd have met with some on you before, so if you'll allow me that pleasure again, I'll try to amuse you once more. It's pleasant to meet and shake hands with old friends, though it very oft pains us to find that the sun of prosperity's withered some hearts that once were both loving and kind, and some that we knew when they in lasses and lads and now, like one's self, get in a hurry, while others have finished life's bottle down near, and now they are gone forward to glory. Thou Reaper keeps slashing away with his scythe, first on one hand and then on the other. Now some darling's pet lambs really hurried away, then some silver-haired sister or brother. There's money a dear loved one packed up and gone warm, since last year when we met together. They've thrown out their anchors, their barks are new moored. Let's hope they're enjoying good weather. We shall all have to go, young and old, rich and poor, whatever our kindred or nation. Death sweeps all before him and cares now to toll, for neither rank, title or station. Well, where are we for, those of us that's left? Have we settled what haven we'll boot to? Is the craft up his sailing seaworthy and sound? Is the pilot to safe and to loot to? How are souls are like musical instruments, ha, ah, and they're here to be put into tune. This earth's no but the schoolhouse a practising ground. The grand concert takes place up a boon. Let's everyone see it, our lamps so well trimmed, and the lights burning clearly and steady. And when the bridegroom comes knocking at door, may he find that we're all on us waiting and ready. Dear readers, for once you'll excuse me, I'm sure, for penning so serious a strain. For you know very well that it's more in my line to write in a humorous vein. But a feeling of this, Matt, comes all one at times that we can us shake off if we would. I'd sooner be the off, take me pen in me hand, to please you a bit, if I could. So come now, just straighten your faces a bit, and try to look cheerful and jolly. You fling all your cares on one side a bit, John, and you mop up those tears of yours, Polly. And though gloomy clouds may be over in o'er, flinging shadows o'er the life of a mon. Let's spread ourselves out for the good things that God sends, and drink in all the sunshine we can. Thee and Me by Samuel Laycock That living at thy country seat, among all gents and nobs, that servant girls to cook thy meat, and do thy bits of jobs. I'm lodging here with Bridget Yates, at the cot near the Cowland Well. I mend me stockings, peeled potatoes, and wash me shirts myself. Thou wears a finer coat than me, thy purse is better lined, and fortunes lavish more of thee than the rest of humankind. Life storms up rage about this yet, and pelt so hard at me, that many a time I've wished thou dead, but seldom trouble thee. Thou rich in all this world can give, thou silver and thou's gold, but me I find it hard to live, I'm poor, getting out. These fields and lines I'm rambling through, they all belong to thee. I've only just a yard or two to cower in when I day. When thou rides out, the folk all around, stung gaping up at thee, because that worth ten thousand pound, but scarcely notice me. I trudge about for spot to spot, and nobody seems to care. They never seek my humble cot to ask me how I fare. If I should be, there's lots of folk would fret and cry, no I doubt, when I shut up the lonely joke and say he's just gone out. I'll never need him let him go and find another poor. We're never to a chap or two with plenty more at sort. I'll have a stone placed over that grave 
to show thy name and age, and all thou hast done that's good and brave, be seen on history's page. When I get tumbled into the ground, thou'll ne'er be nought to show, who's resting neath that grassy mound, or nobody'll want to know. But down in grave what spoils at sport, no ray a leak and sheen, and th worms will have a hard work to sort thy pampered clay from mine. So when this world for the next thou swaps, take with thee under stone, thy coat of arms and bits of traps, or else thou ne'er be known. Pack up thy albert hoop and pin, and opera glass and all, be sure thou sees them all put in before thy gangs below. Then if some hungry worm should come to root about thy bones, thou may stand a better chance than some, if it's known thou art Mr. Jones. But up above there's one that sees through thought of every mon, and he'll just find thee as the days, so day as well as come. And when down here this camping ends, and all our faults forgiven, let thee and me still show we friends, be shaking arms in heaven. A Respectable Mon by Samuel Laycock Between these shoe soles and this hat stands a very respectable mon, and nobody'll contradict that. And why? Because nobody gone. There's none of your hypocrites here, deceiving all the folk at this scene. I'm no no but what I appear. There's none of your dirt about me. Respectable? Well, and what's that? Does it mean to be polished a bit? Sport a silver knob cane and silk cap, and be called Mr. Muggins? Not it. You say this old jacket, I guess. Well, it covers as decent a brick. As ever were moulded, oh yes, in every way quite up to date. There's Joe Dandy, Tom Vane, and Bob Breit. These think we'll of themselves one may see, but they when a stand bringing to leak and comparing with somebody like me. They may curl up their noses and laugh when they happen to meet me on way. They may turn out their slang and their chaff. But I'm the yed above them, ony day. I knows I'm no one donned up so smart, And you wouldn't give much for this hat, But I hope I've a good, honest heart, And it's summat to be proud on, is that? I can boast neither houses nor lands, And wealthy relations I've none, But I've getten me brains and me ons, And thank God I can call these me own. Ah, me own, and they shackle be known, from me toes to me topping I'm free, and let tyrants do all that they con, I mean to be so till I do. I've getten the good sense to behave, and respect those that puts in to rule, but I'll never be reckoned a slave, I'll never be used as a tool. I've no patience with dandified gents, One's sick of so much of this pride, They're soaking with air oils and scents, But there isn't much else beside. Now, I told you, when first I begun, I were a very respectable mon, Bless your life, I were known in me fun, Find a decenter chap if you con. How oh, you're grinning at what I've just said. I dare say you think I'm no one right. But I'll stick me out at on me head and be trudging. Good night, folk. Good night. Oh, this boil by Samuel Laycock. Oh dear, oh dear, I do feel queer. Pooing me face and cowering here all this while. Reach me that stew here, will take it, and let me rest me leg a bit. Oh, this boil! If these are boils I want no more, I'd rather have a roast, I'm sure, pig or goose. Robin, they mind that jeer of thine, the mon keep off this leg of mine, it's no use. Confound this stinking drawing solve, 
It makes me bawl out like a calf. What a bore! I down a stir myself a peg, For fear lest I should hurt me leg. It's a sore. I've sweat with tooth what money a time. I've had me fingers brunt with lime. I've so. I've walked with blistered feet for miles. But I'm prepared to swear this boils weren't her all. I think thou plays about at worst. Kit when dost think it's bound to burst. Tell me that. For oh, I do feel dreadful bad. If it doesn't get wheels soon, I'll go mad and punce a cat. I down a laugh, I down a cry. I'm frightened I should hurt me thigh. Their skin's so tight. I've showed me boil to limpin Ned. He says I shouldn't a gettin wed. Sows me right. I'd hearted wretch in human clown. To kick a fella when he's down isn't right. He met a kept that to his sen. At least while well, I'd got up again on me feet. Oh dear, whenever mun I stir, I've never been outside at door for a week. I've cowered so long inside this room that I haven't getting a bit of bloom on me cheek. I'm greatly done, I'm rink fagged out. I shall have to vomit soon, I doubt. Come here, Ted, and stir thou good for nothing thou. Oh, up, oh, up, it's coming now. Out me yed, oh dear, I am gone sick and queer. Tap me and lay me on the couch chair for a while. Oh, what a torment to be sure. What healthy things I want no more. Oh, this boil. To Poverty by Samuel Laycock Thou art here again, welcome this way. We've been out chums for many a day. We've often differed when we and met, but never had a parting yet. I can't say I'm fond of thee, then why dost stick so fast to me? I know I used to be some and mad, thou plague me so when I were a lad. Thou knows that time when Robin Clegg fell off the barn door and broke his leg. Poor lad, I took him on me knee. And should out him but for thee. What can a body do that's poor? I cried a bit, but now no more. Well, never mind, he get it set, And thee and me are out chums yet. I've tried for years to shake thee off, And went last winter thou'd a cough. I hope to see thee laid in ground, But the summer weather's brought thee round. Well, pull thy chair up, warm thy shanks, I'll sit and watch thee play thy pranks. I mean to shut thee when I come, Till then I'll face thee like a mon. They'll have fair play, that I didn't fear, Now, now, thou see no shuffling here, I'll tell thee plainly, thou art a pest, And spoilt me money a good night's rest. Thou stole me supper to the night, And sent me to bed, we cowed wet feet. I didn't relish this, would thou? Well, come, we'll let it pass o'er now. How is it thou ne'er goes to see? Big folks, it's better off na me. There's plenty up and down in Lond, at thou do well to tap bite thond, and lead em every day to school. There's young Nat Wild, poor silly foo. He's lots of brass, but no much wit. Go play thy pranks with him a bit. I've had me friends, fond, firm and true, And dear relations not a few, But no one of these and stuck to me As firmly and as long as thee. And after all, it's hardly right To go and turn thee out in straight, And one not knowing where thou art bound, I conna do it, sit thee down. Quality Row by Samuel Laycock Being a poor working man, it's but little I know About people living in Quality Row And to tell you the plain truth, it's but seldom one goes Unless it's to walk or to beg some old clothes However, I went the other day with a friend 
and a few bits of trifles picked up there I've penned, in a plain warmly style, for there's now very fine, about these rough rambling sketches of mine. Mr. Bolus, M.D., lives at first house in row, and those at a railing will do well to go. Now, he's always a womb, except when he's out, and he's always his specs on, except when he's bound. It's no one of much consequence what a chap ails, for he's very successful, except when he fails. That his charges are moderate, there's none can deny, except now and then when they get rather high. The next door lives a parson, a kind-hearted mon, at glories in doing all the good at he con. If anyone's poorly and wants him to pray, he's willing to go, either neat time or day. When he meets support, he'll get out of his hond, and shake it as if he were rich as in Lond. Whenever I meet him, he touches his hat, and there's no many parsons in town'll do that. The next door to this parson, at house number three, there's a young lady's school kept by Miss Nancy Lee. I have a cousin that goes, and I met her one night, and who is really polished, who is some and bright, and who does spread the feathers about when who walks, and screws up her mouth when who simpers and talks, who's going up to London, who tells me next week, to translate the word turnip to Latin and Greek. Well, the next I shall notice is house number six. There's a fellow lives there that makes clay into bricks. He's moderately steady, teetotal, I think, except at odd times when he's getting his drink. I now and then leet on him coming my way, when he's been on a punch bowl soaking his clay, but as clay isn't easy to mull when it's dry, I say no, but let him go quietly by. At house number seven, dear o' me, what a life, and how bachelor lives, a poor fellow bout wife. If you'll peep under curtain some neat when you pass, you'll see him cowart moping and counting his brass. He should have a big house full of children to keep, then he won't be seen pottering about half asleep. For they'd loosen his joints for him, we'll never fear, and keep him from getting so rousty and queer. Have another to mention, it's house number nine. A relation lives there, a rich uncle of mine. He owns some good shop between Oldham and Lees, at a venture to think will be mine when he dies. I'm aware of Tower Charlie does all that he come, to poke his nose in and get thick with thoud mum. But it's all to no use, he'll be chatted, he'll see, for me Uncle John promised he'd leave them to me. Well, I think I'll give o'er, you'll be weary, I doubt, and I've mentioned old folks that I know much about. I've missed two or three at living in row, but if they feel slighted, I'll give em a go. And though I've no one getting much talent or time for drawing out sketches in Lancashire rhyme, I may try to please you a bit with me pen some day when I've been round that quarter again. Second Visit to Quality Row by Samuel Laycock Well, I've been round again with me basket and poke and drawing another rough sketch at fine folk, but I'm warned to be rather more careful this time and keep certain characters out to me rhyme. There's one or two chaps rarely pottered, I know, cos they fancy they're living in quality row. Now it's true, and they've threatened to kick me some day when they happen to lead on me going that way. I spoke to the Friday to one of these chaps, but he wouldn't speak back, he'll speak next time, perhaps. If he does, it's re right, I can up and get through. I shall know but I rather less talking to do. If the cap doesn't fit em, they are no need to wear it, but I'm free to no stretch it, so fur till they'll tear it. E, there has been some booing and frabbing for sure, such measuring a yeds as I never seed afore. They're wiser than I am, a deal, if they know, where there is such a place as a quality row. 
It's no but a picture in brains of a bard, a bit of a contrast to Bowton's yard. However, I think one can see pretty clear at the old tall angels that's living up there, for I found when I'm round with me basket and poke at they and vices and failings just like other folk, and being up here, they am further to fall now those that are living in thousands below, for spite of bow windows, brass knockers and bell, they in their trials and sorrows as well as one's self. He have seen one poor mother go very near mad, because who had to bury a dear little lad, and all the fine things couldn't give her relief, for who cowers upon sofa yond nurse in her grief. There's old Mr. Jones lives at house number ten. You met think him about one of the happiest of men. Whenever one sees him, he's always well dressed, and a goward Albert chain hanging down at his breast. But look at him greyly, and if you're no blind, you'll see at his some mack a care on his mind. It's true his some houses up yonder at Glent, but what use are those if he conna get rent? Then look at Miss Goldthorpe, at number eleven, as fair as an angel just dropped out of heaven. And talk about brass, why who's rolling in wealth, but cannot enjoy it because who's bad health? Well then there's thou lady that's living next door, but I haven't much time now to write about her. But from what I could hear the other day it appears, who's a poor helpless cripple and has been for years. Well, come now, what's lesson for me and for you? A tout to be learned out to quality row. This, there's two or three things we should prize a boon wealth. They're a contented mind, a clean breast and good health. Cock, cock, galaid by Samuel Laycock. Well, well, there's no occasion to make o' this bother. If thou's laid it's all right, and it needs nought no more. There's nought very striking about thy performance, one's year to ends laying and swaggering before. How thy noise, thou young beggar, and get back to thank goat, or thou whackin' old neighbours in yard, I'm afraid. That becoming a bore and a regular nuisance, when this clattering nonsense thy Cock a laid. Why, layin' a nag or two's nout to get wild o'er, do we ever get brag from a cow breeding cow? Do birds, when they're laid, ever publish their actions, annoying their neighbours? If not, why should thou? We're bothered enough here in neat time with tomcats, but their hideous noises are thrown into shade, and aren't worth naming with a cock crowing nonsense, and thy silly clatter, thy cock cock a laid. And the cock, what's he got to do with it, I wonder? Art a bound to tell him every time thou may lay? If thou art, it's a case, and I do hope to goodness, thou let him up news in a quieter way. For to sleep after daily is quite out of the question, where the noises that thee and thou tomcats have made, and I shouldn't be surprised at this folk in the asylum, it's been sent there through listening to cock cock a laid. Now I'm mad now to boasting in men nor in poultry. There's follies and frailties in breedest and best, and what appears great may turn out very little if our actions are properly put to a test. And it strikes me a hen should be humble and modest and not all a little achievements parade. But to me it sounds very like bluster and swagger. Does cock, 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 cock a laid? When a chap goes to bed, it's bit object to sleep in. But what does it matter what plans may be laid? If thou cocks thy yed up as soon as it's daily, and sings the tune that the cow deed on, cock, cock a laid. They tap my advice, and when next there's done laying, go quietly back to thy perch, and there sit, like a fowl that's just finished a brilliant achievement, in short, like a hen, 
uh, lays claim to some wit. <laughs> Owd Fogey by Samuel Laycock Owd Fogey lives in Turner's Foud, near Matty Wilson's school, and everybody knows him there because he's such a fool. Last week he pawned his Sunday clothes and sold a favourite tit, and now he hasn't a opening left. He's drunk it every bit. He took their Johnny's testament to Barney Logan's sale, and the bit of brass he get for that he spent on gin and ale. He's made away with lots of things. He's drunk his pig and coat, and on his profit the poultry brings goes down his thirsty throat. There's no of any value left except poor Jane, his wife, and who's so knocked about in world, who's weary of her life, and about the week afore the unwed, he took her on his knee, and swore he'd always treat her well, but as he'd done, not he. His garden's covered all with weeds, and a fence is broken down, he used to have as nice a plot as any chap in town. He took a pride in garden then, he were in it every night, but now you'd hardly give a groat for all he has in seat. Last year he'd lots of cauliflowers, and beans and peas and all, he'd twenty first-rate gooseberry trees and celery sticks to show. He built a house for growing plants and spent a pound on glass, but this he sowed to Farmer Jones and had a spree with brass. A pig he had, worth thirty bob, he sowed for seven and six, to somebody down in Kinder Lane, it's just like all his tricks. He's reckless what he says or does, and when he's soaked his clay, he cares for now to no nobody, he'll give his things away. A month since, some at neighbours here, sowed off their poultry stocks. Owd Falgie went and bought them all, he'd twenty hens and cocks. Next day he went to Gaping Goose at bottom end of town and sold out lot to Boniface for what? A half a crown. He cowered there drinking grog and stuff till twelve o'clock at night but when he reached his womb next day weren't he a bonny seat. His coat were daub from top to tail with slurring down a brew but nobody pitied him because He's such a silly fool. How to Raise the Wind by Samuel Laycock I tell you what, folk, it's surprising to think what scheming there is to get out of some drink. It really astonishes one to see its skill some of the women display to get out of her jill. I were told a queer sort of a skit to the night, be a friend that happened to late on its street. If you like, I can set to and tell it a gone. It'll be an hour's practice, a soul for me pen. Well, a Japanese wife were once hard up for brass. They both couldn't have muster up the price of a glass. Till at last an idea come into wife's head. So I turned to old Robin, her husband, and said, They roll up them sleeves and away with thee out. That landlord at Swan'll be somewhere about. When he sees that's thy coat off, he lasts where that been, so tell him that's let of a job down in town, and that just going to it a mackin' a start, and I'll bet the ain't it, he'll chop the a quart. Well, Robin thought that were no such a bad plan, so he acted at once on the advice of the nan, and he rolled up his sleeves and he went out to the door, and spied out thou landlord afore he'd gone fur. So Robin pretended to be in a swat, he pooed a great napkin from out of his hat, and when he gated a wipe in his face, and hurried along at a very quick pace, when he get facing a swan and were about him past door, thou landlord said, Robin, old lad, where tart a for? But Robin pretended he'd no time to stop, and told him he'd let have a stunning good shot. Well, come, said thou landlord, I'll trust thee a quart. I'm fain at that going and making a start. Folk gets working are the best sort for me, I can tell, though I'm no very partial to working myself. 
Come in, mon, and have an old quart more to lot. Thou can call in at reckoning and pay off thy shot. Well, Robin went in, and his ale was soon brought. Come, this hasn't been badly managed, he thought. So he swigged off his ale, laid his pitcher on thob, and told the long lord he wanted to be off to his job. But thou fox turned his heels when he get out to the sea, and played for their house down in Parliament Street, while his wife were at door, who were weshing a pan, so who started asking him how he'd gone on. Gone on, said old Robin, the dirl's in that yed. Why, everything's happened just same as thou said. This is the best trick that's placed in our wed to thee, Nan. We'll make a good thing out at landlord at Swamp. I said I'd a job and we're going down to start. So he took me in the house and he fetched me a quart and said when I brass I could call in and pay. So I drunk off my ale and I bid him good day. Where's me coat? I'll go tell Sam Dix what I've done. It'll just please him rarely, he's fond of some fun. Where's thy coat? said his wife. Ah, me coat, where's it gone? Come be handy and bring it and let's put it on. Thy coat, lad, thy coat, why I put it up spout, just to think I'd finally drink and serve myself bout. He, I wish you'd seen Robin when his wife told him that. He sprang out at the house without jacket or hat, went leathering down the street to an uncle of mine, and said if he'd find him a pledge card he'd sign. The wife had learnt him a lesson he'd never learnt afore, so that day he signed pledge and ne'er touched drink any more. Thou Bellman by Samuel Laycock They may talk of Tom Brown being as soft as a calf, but I warrant thou Bellman to be soft a bit thaw. Scarce a day passes o'er, but he's poo in his face, and blethering and crying all up and down place. T'other day Snuffy Bet had bum Bailey's in shop, getting ready for selling her besoms and pop, and among other sundries were thowed woman's cap. Well, I'm blessed if the house softy didn't cry about that. He cried when Dick Whitehouse sowed off at his farm. I met him same day with his bell on his arm, so I asked him how it were he were bawling so loud, if the things belonged him, as were bound to be sowed. Now, indeed, em, he said, crying's part of me trade, and I dare say that would yowl a bit, too, if that were paid. Well, I said, there's no telling what one may have to do. I know I once cried o'er an onion or two. A day or two sin I were going down the street on a bit of an errand, when who should I meet? But how Jamie whip bells, so says I, what's up now? Oh, now, no, but Jonathan Smith lost a cow, and he gave me a shilling to go round and cry. I'm on duty, I says, so excuse me, goodbye. Stop a bit, mon, I said, as I've not much to do. If they'll give me the tone, I'll cry a bit too. Not today, Jamie said, I can manage myself. Tong tong tingle tum tingle tum tingle tum down. Lost a cow that belongs unto Jonathan Smith. Those that foreign it mum bring it to Bellman forthwith at number nineteen Betty Singleton's yard, where the find old meet with a handsome reward. Now you chap says a job might got a deuce of your aim. Find Jonathan's cow gun. God save the Queen. Well, I seen him again a week after or so. He were plastering some macabills on a wall. Oh, Jamie, I said, what become of that cow? Were it found t'other day when they cried it or how? Found? I to be sure. Mon, I knew where it were. I'd had it all time at our back door. When I'd done going round, I went one with me bell, took the cow, said I found it, get the brass for myself. He thou rascal has said to do tricks such as these, wherever dost think they'll have to go to when they're days. Here I think I can manage to find thee a job. So I told him I'd lost one of the children, our Bob, and I gan him a papa of what he had to say, and a shilling or two, and then sent him away. 
the first corner he come to, he up with his bell. Tongle ting tum, tingle tum, tingle tum dell. Last other day, I was some time to mourn. As pretty a bobby as ever were born, it has cheeks like red roses to bonny blue in, and it smelled dull with treacle the last time it was seen. It's just cutting its teeth and has very sore gums, and it's getting a habit of sucking its thumbs. Those that find it may keep it, there's nobody who'll care, for those that have lost it and lots more to spare. He there was some rare laughing when Jamie had done, some of the women reached screamed, they thought it such fun. But the chap was so mad, he threw papa on the floor, and swore he'd never cry or lost children no more. Since that time he's tried hard to keep out to me seat, still I now and then drop on him somewhere in the street, and I always inquire if he's wanting a job. If he is, he can go round a seeking our bob. What I Like by Samuel Laycock Attention please and look at me, and I'll tell you what I like to see. Now I like to see folk doing well, how glad it always maps one feel, for though I'm getting grey and old, me heart is neither hard nor cowed. I feel as free and strong on the wing, as when I first began to sing. I like to calm me down it noot and read a bit from some nice boot. Good boots are the thoughtful student's gowd. They'll please and bless both young and old. I like to join an evening song when days are short and the nights are long. I like to mix with the good and true to spend a pleasant hour or two. I like to tack a walk at night when the moon and stars are shining bright. When the flowers have shut their e'en and said Good night to the dew and gone to bed. When youths are walking out in grove With maidens that they fondly love. And money and art the slover's tale Is borne along on the evening scale. I like to hear a good old song Up out in the reap denouncing wrong. A song that cheers one on his way And points him to a brighter day. A song of gratitude to heaven for the showers of mercy is freely given, a song of thankfulness and love, from man below to God above. I like to see an aged pair, cowered side by side with silvery hair, waiting with anxious, tearful eyes, a cult up mansion in the skies. I like to read a noble deeds, where rich men see to poor men's knees, and love to stretch their hands to bless, and comfort those in deep distress. I like me friends, me country too, and everything that's good and true. I'm fond of rhymes, and now and then I like to tap me humble pen, and paint some thought that pleases me, for other curious minds to see. And all me pictures fail to please, I'm satisfied and feel at ease. I'm fond of trees, I'm fond of flowers, I like to stroll through leafy bowers. Where merry songbirds meet to sing, And the woods with echoes fairly ring, When earth and air unite to raise One grand triumphant song of praise, While angel bands are hovering round, As if entranced with joyful sound. I like to worship, not to scoff, I like me foes a long way off. Me cats and dog I like to see, Me children clambering round me knee. I like a bit of good advice, to kiss a pratty woman twice. I've won like more, but shame to tell. Well, this is it. I like me sell. John Booth and the Vicar by Samuel Laycock A certain old vicar, no one fur from this spot, among other folk he looked after a got. A chap called John Booth, he and thought rather queer. Everybody knew John when he and living on here. And though it was said he was no one greatly right, he was sharp and a lot, so I know, a fine seat. Now the vicar asked John to do all that he could to bring him some news, so he promised he would. Well, one night when John were asleep in his bed, he'd a very strange dream come into his head, and it seems when he wackened he didn't intend to keep it so long without telling his friend. 
for soon on it morning to vicar he hide, as it happened thou fella was smoking outside. So he see John come leathering down very fast, right cram full of news, as if ready to brast. Well, John, said the vicar, how are you today? You seem to have something important to say. What's the news? Let us have it at once, if you please. Then no doubt you'll feel rather more at your ease. Well then, if you please, sir, last night when in bed, I had a sort of a dream like coming to me head. I thought I was going up to heaven, don't you know? Just so, said the vicar. I hope you will go. But how did you like the place? How did you fare? And what did you see in your rambles up there? Well, sir, if you please, I went straight up to the door. But when I get there, I couldn't get any fur. So I started and punched it with one of these shoon, for a year they were singing some mack of a tune, and thought if I didn't make a middling big din, I should never be yeared and never get in. Well, sir, as I stood there as white as a clout, Peter opened the window and bobbed his yed out, and I am here from my yed to my feet, he asked what I wanted at that time at night. I think it was then about half past eleven. I told him I wanted to get into heaven. Then he asked where I'd lived and what were I called. But he'd known he'd tossed that, for I was certain he knowed. Well, I said I went living in Smallshaw just then, with uncle of mine they called Slavering Ben. Then he asked where I went to on Sundays when there, so I told him to church when I went anywhere. Then he asked me to give him a bit of a prayer, but I told him I couldn't, I'd get none to spare. He owed his scowl at these old clothes of mine, I dare say he'd think I were no one donned up so fine. Well, he pooed in his yed and he banked window down, and then, sir, my oaks were all very near flown. I cowered outside till I'm getting wheel starved, and felt really pottered at trick I'd been served. For I didn't think Peter were unserving me, right, to let me cow wait in so long with cow feet. I thought one were hampered and clemmed enough here, about going a clemming and starving up there. However, at last Peter opened me door, and he what a fine looking mansion it were. Come forward, he said, and I'll reach thee a chair, but I might as well tell thee, thou'll know nobody here. We ain't had plenty through Oldham, from Royton and Lees, but there's nobody from Smallshaw, no more, nor the seas. I'll tell thee what, John, them I think it seems queer, but thou art the first that the old vicars ever sent us up here. Bishop Fraser and the Collier by Samuel Laycock Sit still, and I'll tell you a bit of a skit in which the late Bishop Fraser once figured a bit. If you ain't heard it afore, you'll not think it's a crime, if I tell it again in plain Lancashire rhyme. While the bishop, it seems, when on one of his tours, had to preach at a place they call Bolton the Moors. And though so vast clever, I'm sorry to say, he somehow or other get out of his way. So I seen an old collier a bit on a yed, he were known very long for he and at him and said, Can you tell me the best way to Bolton, my man? Ah, said the chap, looking up, If I try hard, I can. And that seems to be carrying the heaviest load. Just walk on with me and I'll put the on road. Then he eyed the bishop o'er from his head to his feet, And after being satisfied that all had been right, The collier pooed and a pipe out, And soon had it lit, then said, "Hand over thy bag, and I'll carry it a bit. The bishop handed it over, and what followed I'll tell, As near as I can, as I yearn it myself. It strikes me, said Collier, that thou never does no work. Art a parson of summer at say up in church? Well, yes, said the good bishop, I cannot deny That I am in the church, and may say rather high. Well, where does to come from, and who met the bee? There's a fine shovel out, and where's leggings, I say? I'm the bishop, my man, as you're anxious to know. 
"'You're the bishop?' said the chap, staring at him. "'What, you? Well, I never heard like, and that the bishop, thou says, "'and walking with me with me black-looking face.' "'Why shouldn't I?' said the bishop, still striding along. "'For in walking with you I can see nothing wrong. "'Well, happen it's not a bit right that there should, "'but there isn't so money, Lord Bishops, at would. "'If thou art the bishop, thou no road to heaven, I guess.' "'Well,' said the bishop, a little bit fluttered like, "'yes, I think, my good man, I may venture to say, that I am able and willing to point out the way. If you come to the church where I'm preaching to-night, I think we can manage to put matters right, said the collier, but I'm no one so sure about that, though that the bishop wears leggings and fine shovel hat. If thou can a find Bowton thou asking of me, how thou knows the road to heaven, well, I canna just say, Poor Pussy by Samuel Lacock Thou art one of God's creatures, come in here, come in. Poor Pussy, thou art hungry, looking and thin. Our John's just been telling me how thou's been used. It's shameful is the way it is seen thee abused. Poor thing, and that nubber a kittling I see. And yet now t'y lads couldn't let thee a be. But thou's met with a friend, it'll keep thee from harm. So cower thee down here, where it's cosy and warm. It's the wrong time at year to be taken out in, And yet I shall never be guilty at sin, A turning me back on a creature in need, If it's no but a cat I am able to feed. Lie thy down close to the thob, and I'll fetch some more coal. Thou shalt join me at best that I have in this hole. Where's thy mother, I wonder? Well, that thou can't tell, But thou'rt rather too young to turn out be thee sell. Now then, here's a supper warm milk in a plate. Lap it up and be sharp, for thou need summat to eat. Here, John, lad, they slip into butchers next door For a penneth of leets, and say what they for. He's a good-natured fellow, is Alfred McClure. If he knows what they're for, he may send Ray the more. He's fond of a dog, is thou lad, he is that. Let's hope he can feel for a poor starving cat. Here's John with those leets, come and have a tuck in, and we'll cure thee a looking so famished and thin. As to getting nine lives, some cats on this end, well stop here with me, and they'll happen at ten. Come here now, come here, for thou mustn't go out, or thou'll get welly kilt with the bad lads that's about. They think it fine sport to will use such as they. Jump up and allow thee a bit on me knee. Well, it's the way of this world when one's power fagged and down, and friends that should care for us, every one flown. There's always some ready, Tom, Harry, or Dick, Twirl us still lower and give us a kick, Like some hungry vultures that hovers around, And fattens its carcass some meat at some sound. So these having passions degraded and low, Can feed upon cruelty, revel midst woe. I'd rather this minute be clem same as they, As friendless and wombless the cowers on minnie. No be cursed with mean actions like some I could name, that are soulless and heartless and glory and shame. Thou pricks up thy ears, and thou holds up thy head. Thou may understand every word I have said. Thou hast as much sense, and thou knows what to do with, as that wretch that were punching thee up and down straight. Well, I'm thinking with summat to be thankful for, John. It's grand lad to do a kind act when we come. I've taught thee a lesson I want thee to heed Whenever thou meets a poor creature in need Let's always deal gently with suffering and sad Then God will deal gently with us, me dear lad And if ever, like the cat here, we get cast adrift There's no doubt but what somebody'll give us a lift Thank you, sir On receiving a Christmas goose from a parson, 
by Samuel Laycock. Last Saturday night, as we're nursing our Bob, and running a two, three things o'er him in knob, somebody pooed at our bell. So I went to the front door, and when I got there, some astonished I were, when a young woman muttered some sort of excuse, and said, if you please, sir, I brought you a goose. Me good woman, I said, you're mistaken, I fear. I think you'll do wrong if you're leaving it here. I am perfectly right, I assure you, who said. So I stood two, three seconds there scratching me head, and this young woman stood there quite fast what to do, while I were looking sheepish and feeling so too. At length I said, well, if it's ours, bring it in, but I'm thinking it well he amounts to a sin, for poor folk like we are to fare in this style. It's out to our road this be money a long mile. Sheep yeds and red herring and that mack of stuff are more in our line and are quite good enough. For one hasn't a desire to be the same as our peel. A deed to the Sunday through living so well. He ate so much cabbage and mate of that kind that he didn't leave house room enough for his wind. He were a fine looking fella as ever one said. Well, old Master Peel, it's a pity he did. Well, your reverence, I'm forty year old, rather more, but I've never seen a goose come in our house afore, and we dunna know how we to coop such like things. Dun ye talk job lot, the tail, feathers, and wings? Dun ye roast em or boil em or fry em or what? Our Jack says he dare say they done up in fat. Same as fish, cow potatoes, and stuff of that mat, but I never tap no notice at all, o oh, old Jack. Well, me thanks, Mr. Parson, for the present you and sent, and hope oh, but you'll never have no cause to repent. Having sent a poor feller a goose to his dinner, for it's one of the best ways of converting a sinner, your sermons, though good, aren't half as much use for rousing one up as a savoury goose. If you'd make an impression on such like as me, you'll have to appeal to our stomachs, you see. Now, I've no doubt at all, but in this sort of weather, a goose spite with gospel would do well together. Our Saviour saw the wisdom of this, for we read, that he once gave his hungry disciples a feed. Well, I'll drop it, your reverence, I've said enough now, and I've managed to get through me tail or somehow. One met one further, but then what's the use? All I want to say is this, I'm a bleach for that goose. Help Yourselves, Lads, by Samuel Laycock Dinner steal, and out me, brothers, that's knowing what I mean, not it. Now it's this, loot less to others, try to help yourselves a bit. Now I'm no great politician, up to thin in it, same as some. I believe a man's possession may be mended, most a womb. Thirty years I've been a toiler, the most at time in cotton mill. Sweat as hard as best among ye. Ah, and lads, I'm working still. Working when you're nicely dozing, working with a weekly frame. Thinking, feeling, and composing, not to give myself a name. But to try and raise me, brothers, those at labour by me side, sons at same dear English mothers, Britain's glory, strength and pride. Oh, may God in heaven above us, help me in me humble task, give me will and strength to do it, brothers, this is all I ask. Let's be thoughtful, let's be sober, get our drinks from nature's wells, put less confidence in others and a bit more in ourselves. Some consider Tories reasons, friends at work in men and such, others some call liberals Britons, none of these can help us much. At the elections here I've yeared you, set up money a rare good shout, well, and what will this work bring us, not much cheese and bread I doubt. Bless your lads, it is but little, only one down here can do, 
The best of men and a bit mortal, often selfish, seldom true. Brother Tyler's let's no longer trust to this or that big mon. The chaps at Lunnon can do now, Mitch. Help yourselves, lads, all you can. Let me ask you to give her drinking. Nobody's power to raise you up. Nobody can prevent you sinking while you're slaves to summit to suck. The world's a ring with rustlers in it. Life's a conflict. Let's wear in. Struggle monthly and bravely. Same as those that mean to win. If successful, let's keep humble. If be partner, never heed. The best of men must sometimes tumble. The bravest warriors sometimes bleed. Time's too precious to be wasted. Life's too short to fling away. Let's all set to work in earnest. Hoping to see a brie today. Dunna look so much to others. Drink deep draughts from wisdom's wells. Carve your own way out, me brothers. Help yourselves, lads. Help yourselves. Foot Passengers Keep to the Right by Samuel Lego. It's been said that there's salmons in stones. Well, judging by those in our foud, I'm a bit insane mind as Tom Jones. At such sermons must feel rather cowed. This old mind, though it's known at first stump, it's as good as this heart can indict. Me text came from the post of a lamp. His foot passengers keep to the right. And firstly, I'd argue beware, of the dandy at tax greater pains to convince us his nice curly hair than he does to convince us his brains. There's words of deceit on his tongue, calculated fair prospects to blight. If you tread in his steps, you'll be wrong. Young fellas, keep on to the right. Let the standard you go by be true. Measure men by his mind, not his purse. There's money a great squire at a foo, and a drunken foo too, and that's worse. We've lots of rich men one could name, a torrid won drunk every night. Well, this is a scandalous shame, so fuck passengers keep to the right. Let the motives that guide you be pure, proceeding from hearts full of love. Deal gently with the erring and the poor, for kind acts are recorded above. To lead folk to virtue and God, exert all your influence and might. Bid em guard against fashion's smooth road. Ask em kindly to keep to the right. Keep out of those traps that are laid. The brown cow, the black horse and the blue bell. There's a curse on their damnable trade. And on the death-dealing drink that they sell. While you tramp through this wearisome world. Keep the goal that you aim at in sight. Let the banner of truth be unfurled. With this motto on, keep to the right. Some tempt to make gum with his wiles, Try to get you to tread in wrong track. Tap no heed to his words and sweet smiles, But like Jesus did say, stand back. Tap no notice of praises or frowns, Don't fret or your looks growing white, Or he adds will be glorified crowns To those that keep on to the right. If dark gloomy clouds should appear, To overshadow your eyes and your homes, Light your lamps and take care they burn clear, And be ready when the bridegroom comes. Should the sky appear cloudless a boon, And your prospects be hopeful and bright, Beware, for a storm may come soon, Be cautious and keep to the right. When death your last summons shall bring, To be sharp and back up and be gone, you can calmly, triumphantly sing. I'll be with thee as soon as I come. And how the angels in heaven will rejoice when you bid us your last good night. And you'll hear Christ's own welcome voice. Come up hither, my friend, to the right. <laughs>